Good morning, church. If you can, please stand with us. Jesus said, Sue looked it up for me, in Luke, that um, when, when he was doing his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and he was getting all this praise and um, Pharisees or somebody like that said, shush these people up. And Jesus said, if they don't praise me, the very rocks are going to sing out in my praise. And I thought about that as we practiced and as we sang this song this morning. And um, I don't want to be upstaged by the rocks. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we're going to praise him this morning with this song. Before the rocks cry out, I just have to praise him. church. It's good to see you all today as we gather in the name of Jesus. And uh, I just want to lead us in a word of prayer as we begin. So let's go to the Lord together. Father God, we are grateful to be here today to lift up the praises of Jesus. And today, Lord, we in particular want to pray for our nation and our world on this weekend that as we remember the events of September 11th, those 20 years ago. And Father, we, we pray for peace. It's clear that so much of this world is full of chaos and hate but we know that's not from you. And so, Lord, we pray that there would be a new heart and a mindset in the people of this world that would not be of destruction or of madness, but of kindness and sound thinking and hearts. Lord, we pray for peace and unity in our nation today. We pray that your spirit would pour out among us and that by you and through you that there would be a common heart, a common goal, a, a common desire for peace and kindness toward one another. Lord, let us not lose sight of what is important in this life and help us to love one another as you truly have loved us. We pray, Lord, that you would inspire this nation and this world to follow you, Lord, to be one people that seek to glorify and honor and praise you. That is our heart's desire, Lord. We desire to be your people and we strive to have peace. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we might repent of our wickedness and our rebellion and that we might turn to you and proclaim the goodness of the Lord. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to welcome you today to Garden Way Church. If you're online with us on the live stream, we uh, extend a welcome to you as well. Thank you for being a part of our service. And uh, today is one of those uh, Sundays where the sermon comes first. So you got to put up with me first. All right. We're going to be in Mark chapter 7. And uh, today we're working through the Gospel of Mark. We call this series the uh, Gospel of Mark, Servant and Savior. Today's title is entitled, All Things Well, from Mark 7, beginning in verse 31. Have you ever noticed that what you don't know can get you into trouble sometimes? Sometimes it can even embarrass you. And so it's important to understand what things mean. And so I found a, an actual text message that a mother sent to her son. I'm going to show it to you. It's up on the screen here. So the mom texts the son and she says, your Aunt Ethel just passed away. LOL. 
And the son says, well, why is that funny? And mom says, it's not funny, David. What do you mean? David says, mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh, my goodness, mom says. I sent that to everyone. Oh, my goodness. I thought it meant lots of love. I have to call everyone back. And then David appropriately says, LOL. Oh, my word. <laughs> Knowing what stuff means is important, isn't it? Yes. Oh, my goodness. So as we study through the gospel of Mark, it's important for us to understand what Jesus is saying and what he's really doing. We're going to come to a passage today, a section where we're going to look at a miracle of Jesus. He's going to heal a deaf man who has also a speech impediment. Now, the Gospels are full of various miracles and amazing works and words that Jesus speaks. But in the case of our text today, the people witnessing this miracle come to a very inspiring conclusion based on their observation. And their con conclusion is this, Jesus does all things well. Jesus does everything good. And so the question then we need to ask is, if Jesus does all things well, what does that mean for you and for me? And so let's begin by listening to the text today from Mark 7, verses 31 through 37. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his, hand, his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, that is, be open. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished, because measure saying, beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Amen. Thank you, Colleen. So this is one of the odder miracles in the New Testament, I think. Jesus does some things that are a bit odd and uh, says some things, and it appears that people don't obey him. And so it's just kind of a strange little six section that we're going to look at. But this morning, I want to consider this, this truth, that Jesus does all things well. And if that's true, then what does that mean for you and for me? And we're going to look at a number of things that I think have an impact on us. So let's look at the first one. Because Jesus does all things well, the best thing that you and I can do is bring others to him. Verse 32, the text says, And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. Jesus had been on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and now he is relocated to this area that's called the Decapolis. Nine of the ten cities were on the eastern side of the Jordan River. If you looked at a map today, we would be looking at modern-day Jordan or Syria. Now, this was not a Jewish area. This was an area of the Gentiles. It was the same area that we saw earlier in Mark when Jesus had gone across the sea and he had healed uh, the man that had been consumed with demons. So it's in that area. And you might remember that when he left there, he told that guy, go tell everybody. But now, he says, don't tell anybody. We'll touch on that in just a moment. But when Jesus came into the region, his fame as a miracle worker had already spread. And there's this unnamed man who is brought to him, who is deaf, who can hardly speak. The original language is very interesting here about his speech problem. This speech impediment, it could have been, I don't know, stuttering, or maybe it was just difficult for him to pronounce words since he was deaf. But the word literally means that the tongue was tied up with a string. Today we might say of somebody that they're, what, tongue-tied, right? That's where that comes from. This speech impediment, we don't know exactly what it was, but it was difficult for the man to speak, and he was deaf. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? The man doesn't seek out Jesus for himself. The Bible says that some people brought him to Jesus. 
These might have been family members. They might have been friends. But whatever they were to him, their compassion for their friend and their belief that Jesus could make a difference caused them to escort their friend to Jesus. Maybe that reminds you of another miracle. Remember back in Mark 2 when we were there, there were four friends that brought their friend who was paralyzed to Jesus. Remember that story? They had to tear a hole in the roof and and lower the man down. And my favorite part of that miracle is when Jesus, when it says in the text that Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends. And then he spoke to the paralyzed man. And you remember what he said? Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus honored the faith of those four friends who brought their friend to Jesus. And in our story today, this deaf man, he couldn't call on the name of the Lord, could he? He couldn't speak. He couldn't hear the word of the Lord proclaimed because he was deaf. He needed help. Do you understand that are there people all around you that need help desperately? Do you have a family member? Do you have a friend? Do you have a neighbor? Who needs Jesus? Do you realize that they need your help because they are spiritually disabled? Listen to this little quote from 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where Paul writes that the God of this age, who's that? That's Satan. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. Do you understand, if you're, a, if you're walking with Jesus today, that you're surrounded by people who are blind. They are spiritually blind. They cannot see the gospel. They need help to be brought to Jesus. When you help connect people to Jesus, you are doing the best thing possible for them. When you live and share biblical truth in a compassionate, in a clear way, you are doing the very best thing possible. When you bring your friends or your family members to church, you are bringing them to connect with the body of Christ where the word of God is proclaimed, and that is the best possible thing that you can do for them. The greatest thing that you can do for anyone is to bring them to Jesus because Jesus does all things well. We must bring people to him. Next, we see that because Jesus does all things well, we need to realize that he relates to each of us individually. Individually, that's so important. When they brought the deaf man to Jesus, look at what Mark says in verse 33. Jesus took him aside from the crowd privately. Isn't that interesting? Now, there were many miracles that Jesus performed publicly. In fact, next Sunday, we're going to read about a miracle that impacts thousands of people at one time. But I love the fact that here, Jesus takes this man aside and deals with him privately, individually. I think that Jesus had a tenderness for this deaf man. He he wanted to meet the man where he was at. And to meet his needs. And he does some interesting things. He acts out what he is about to do. He takes his fingers, the divine fingers of the Son of God. And he puts them in the man's ears to indicate that he's going to fix that problem. Then Jesus does something that we see as kind of gross. Right? Let's just be honest. But what does he do? He takes his own saliva, the divine saliva of the son of man, and he places it on that man's tongue to indicate that he was going to fix that problem as well. And then Jesus speaks a word in in Aramaic. Aramaic was the common spoken language of the day, and he says this word, apatha, apatha, and it means to be opened, to be loosed. And suddenly, what happens? The man's ears are open. He can hear the wind. He can hear the birds singing in the distance for the first time. That string binding his tongue is removed, and he's able to speak plainly for the first time. 
to hear his own voice. Can you just imagine the reaction? My goodness. Do you know today there are roughly 360 million people on this planet who live with deafness? That's about 5% of the world's population. And of that 5%, only about 10% of those people have access to, you know, advanced medical science or to have hearing devices. Do you know today there's a surgical procedure called a cochlear implant in which many people with profound hearing loss can hear again or hear for the first time. And I hear something really cool. If you want to be blessed, go to YouTube. Don't do it right now, okay? <laughs> Don't do it right now, but go to YouTube and just type in people hearing for the first time. I, I did this this week, and, and it's amazing to watch the reactions of, of little children, little deaf children, who hear their parents' voice for the first time. When they hear the parents' voice for the first time, they have, they have two reactions. Wide-eyed amazement. They're just blown away. And then smiles and laughter. Over and over, you'll see these videos. And then adults, adults who are deaf, who hear for the first time. Again, wide-eyed amazement. And then the thing that I noticed that was common in all of them, tears. Tears of gratitude, tears of joy, because they can hear for the first time. One of the people in one of the videos I watched, to, uh, she asks the technician who's, who's fine-tuning this new implant, she asks the technician, how does it feel? How does it feel to give people a miracle? Isn't that interesting? Wow. And so can you imagine this poor man as he expresses amazement? And I have to believe there must have been some tears of gratitude as Jesus heals him and brings him speech and hearing for the very first time. So what I want us to understand from this, friends, is do you understand that Jesus loves you individually? individually, just like he did this man, as if you were the only person on this earth. And more importantly, do you understand that Jesus wants to do for you a far greater miracle than hearing or speaking? He wants for each of us to experience the miracle of salvation eternal life there is no greater miracle and you see jesus doesn't save groups of people together he doesn't save nations he doesn't save families there's that old saying that god doesn't have any grandchildren you see we have to belong to jesus and he offers that salvation to each of us and it's offered individually he wants to take you aside from the crowd and to touch you and to open your ears so that you can hear him. Open your mouth so that you can make his name famous. Jesus does all things well. He does so many things well. And as he relates to each of us individually, we are blessed. The next thing that I want you to see here in the text is that because Jesus does all things well, he understands our pain. He understands my pain, and he understands your pain. Before he healed the deaf man, I want you to notice what Mark says in verse 34. Speaking about Jesus, it says, And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him. Let's just stop there. Jesus sighed. Isn't that an interesting word? To sigh. There's all kinds of different sighs, aren't there? There's the sigh of relief when the doctor tells you that the tumor is benign. <sighs> then there's the sigh of fatigue after a long, difficult day. <sighs> right? And then there's the sigh. The sigh of anguish, the sigh of grief when we 
know that someone we care about is no longer with us. We know those sighs, and there are so many other sighs. If you've ever had the chance to visit Venice, Italy, then the chance would be that you would take one of those expensive gondola rides that are so famous there through the crowded canals. And likely they would take you under a famous bridge. And that bridge is called the Bridge of Sighs. It has a, an Italian name that I can't pronounce, but it doesn't matter. The Lord Byron gave it the English name, the Bridge of Sighs. And it is a bridge that leads from the courthouse to the prison. And so convicted prisoners would be led across that bridge on their way to prison. And for some of them, it would be their last glimpse of the beautiful city of Venice their last glimpse of freedom. And thus it became to be known as the Bridge of Sighs. You know, sometimes it can seem like our life is like we're traveling through one long bridge of sighs, one thing after another. Job, you know, old Job, he had so many sighs in his life. Listen to this verse from Job chapter 3. He says, For my sighing comes like bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. What's he saying there? Life is just a whole series of sighs. Sighing is part of our human condition. Jesus was 100% God, but you know what? He was also 100% man. He feels what we feel. He is moved to compassion when we suffer. The Hebrew writer says of Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, and yet was without sin. Jesus understands the difficulties that we go through that we endure, the temptations that we either are victorious over or succumb to. He understands because he's been there. Jesus, the scripture says, was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I, I did a little bit of searching through the, the Bible about this word sigh. And, and it shows up eight times in the New Testament. It's, it's translated either sighed or groaned sighed or groan. For instance, when Jesus showed up at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus who had died, and he saw the tears of Mary, Lazarus' sister, it says that he groaned inwardly. He groaned because he shared Mary's grief. It's the same word. But, you know, Jesus is not the only one who groans or who sighs. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that this body that we live in is like a tent, a temporary dwelling that gets battered and old. And inside this tent, we sometimes groan. We sigh. Have you groaned lately when you've tried to get up out of bed in the morning? You know what I'm talking about, right? That's the same word. It's used of the times that Jesus sighed, that Jesus groaned. In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that the entire creation sighs. And even the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, groans and sighs. Listen to this passage from Romans 8, beginning in verse 22. It says that we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And then in verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit God's Spirit, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with what? Groans, sighs that words cannot express. 
Folks, sometimes we are so burdened that we can't even express it clearly in our words in prayer. And do you understand that that's when our compassionate, loving God sighs and groans with us with words that cannot even be expressed? Isn't that amazing? That's the God that we serve. When you're praying, if you don't know the words to say, don't worry, that's okay. Because God understands sigh language. How's that? He understands our sigh language. We sigh because we're a part of this broken world. That's why Jesus sighed that day as he comes to this man who's broken, whose ears don't work, whose mouth doesn't work. One Bible commentator put it so well that I just want to read, it, read his quote. He says, Jesus was about to heal the deaf man. Why then should he have sighed? In that poor afflicted man, Jesus saw but one more sign of the vast crack and flaw which sin has caused in everything good God has created. When God finished his work, he saw that it was very good. But since that time, the devil has sown evil weeds amid God's wheat. An alien element of suffering intrudes into God's world. A jangling discord clashed into God's soothing music. Earth is no longer Eden. And so, Jesus sighs. He sighs with us. You know, some people blame God for the suffering in this world. But we need to remember that God is a good God who created a good world. It is sin. And it is Satan that have created havoc and the suffering that flows from it. And that is why Jesus sighs. And folks, it's while we will continue to sigh until we see Jesus again. But because Jesus does all things well, he understands our pain. He walks with us through it, giving us strength to endure, helping us to do what we cannot do on our own. And sometimes, sometimes he even brings healing because he is the God who understands our pain. Because he does all things well. Next, I want you to see that because, because Jesus does all things well, we can't resist telling others about him. I love this in the text. In verse 36, it says, And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Isn't that crazy? This is the great irony of the gospel. Now, this wasn't the only occasion when Jesus told some recipient of a miracle, keep quiet about it, don't tell anybody. But if you go back and look at all those, every time Jesus says, be quiet, don't tell anybody, you know what they do? They go and tell everybody. They don't stay quiet. They can't help themselves. Do you realize that today, Jesus has commanded us to tell everyone the great things that he's done for us. We call it the Great Commission. Go and proclaim the gospel. That means to tell everyone the good news about Jesus. But you know what? Most of us remain silent. You see, that's the irony. So why is it that Jesus tells this guy to keep it under wraps? Well, I think there's probably a, a simple reason. Jesus has already been overwhelmed by crowds demanding a miracle. But you see, Jesus understands that his primary mission to planet Earth is not to heal the sick. His primary mission is to die on the cross for the sins of humanity. Jesus knew that the more that people talked about his healing miracles the more that the crowd around him would come just to see the cool stuff, just to get the miracles. But they would miss the message. Folks, how often does that happen in our life? We're focused on what we got God to do. 
We want God to be our magic genie in the lamp or our heavenly vending machine. God, I want this and I want this and I want it now. And we see God as the one that's just there to deliver stuff for us. But we forget that he has a task for us. He's got a job for us to do. He has called us to tell others about him. You know, there are other cases where Jesus does a miracle, and almost always it's surrounding a time where he releases people or gets rid of the demons in their life. I mentioned earlier, remember that man who was consumed by what the scripture said was a legion of demons. Remember, and Jesus, what did he do? He cast them into the herd of pigs. And then the pigs, what happened to them? They died of the swine flu. That's what happened to them. <laughs> but listen to these words in, in, from the Gospel of Luke. This man from whom the demons had gone out and begged to go with him. But Jesus said to him, return home. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. He went out and he told everybody about what Jesus had done for him. And guess what? Now Jesus returns to the same place where this earlier miracle took place. And he heals this deaf man. But you know what? Jesus calls us to do the same thing. Jesus told the man to tell people what God had done for him. And so that's what the man did. He went and talked about what Jesus had done. By the way, one more proof that Jesus is God. Go tell what God has done for you. What does he do? Here's what Jesus has done for me. Jesus is God. Folks, have you been telling people what Jesus has done for you? That is your most powerful tool in your toolbox of sharing the good news about Jesus. You don't need to memorize chapters and verses. You need to be able to verbalize, let me tell you, what Jesus has done for me. And by the way, if you don't have something to tell, then perhaps you need to reflect on your relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus is doing things for us. And the greatest thing that he does for each of us is to release us from the curse of sin and death. And when that happens... It ought to be said of us that we can't resist telling others about him. Let it be so in our lives. Well, finally, because Jesus does all things well, his miracles provide proof that he indeed is the Messiah. I want you to just see the importance of this last verse in our text, verse 37. And they, that is the crowds, were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Jews, as well as some of the Gentiles around Israel, had been looking for a Messiah for a long time. Since the time of the prophet Isaiah and the other prophets had predicted the arrival and one of the ways that people knew to recognize the Messiah was by the miracles that he would perform. Now, over the preceding 400 years leading up to the time of Jesus, there had been many who had come on the scene and had claimed to be the Messiah. But you know what? None of them had performed miracles, they weren't the Messiah. But Jesus comes on the scene, and he meets all the criteria, and he fulfills all the prophecies, and he does the miracles. 700 years before the time of Jesus, listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf be unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Who did that, folks? It was Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind. It was Jesus who healed the deaf. Jesus who raised the paralyzed, who then jumped for joy like a deer. 
It was Jesus who opened the mouth of this mute man to shout for joy. Jesus touched this man at his point of pain. There's a good question just to kind of think on right now. What is your greatest point of pain? Are you struggling? Struggling maybe with guilt and shame from the past? You know what Jesus wants to do? He wants to touch you, and he wants you to say, be forgiven. Rejoice in the freedom that you walk in. Maybe your point of pain is that you're struggling with some terrible grief. Maybe the loss of a loved one. Maybe the disappointment of something in the past. Jesus wants to meet you, and he wants to say to you, be comforted. I am with you. The the bottom line of this miracle, this healing of this deaf man, is that the people said, Jesus has done all things well. Can you say that in your life? Jesus has done all things well. Because he has. Despite the brokenness and the disappointments and the heartache and the failure Despite the rebellion all around us, the deception that this world lives under, Jesus continues to do all things well. And we, folks, will continue to sigh because we live in this world and it's full of pain and it's full of adversity. None of us are immune from suffering. We don't have a choice about the pain, but what we do have is a choice about how we react how we respond to our pain. One of the lesser-known United States presidents was President Franklin Pierce. He was our 14th president. He served from 1853 to 1857. Most historians would agree he was one of the worst presidents in United States history. When the Democratic National Convention was held in 1852, nobody expected Pierce to be nominated. The front runners were Sam Houston from Texas, the great hero, and James Buchanan from Pennsylvania, who later became president. But the party was split, and no candidate got a majority. Finally, on, listen to this, the 49th ballot, the 49th ballot, Pierce was nominated. Well, I guess we got to find somebody. How about Pierce? And he became the nominee. And then in the general election, he easily defeated the the Whig candidate, General Winfield Scott, who had been nominated, listen to this, on the 53rd ballot. (laughs) We think our politics are divided today? Oh, my goodness. But here's the crux of the story. Five weeks before Pierce's inauguration, tragedy struck his family. He and his wife Jane and their young son Benny were riding on a train. There was an accident, and the train derailed. Their son, Benny, was killed. Franklin and Jane were uninjured. Of course, they were devastated by this accident. And they became angry with God. Jane Pierce did not attend the inauguration of her husband. And Franklin Pierce refused to swear on a Bible that day. He chose instead to affirm the oath of office. Jane Pierce was not seen in public for over two years. She hid in the White House writing letters to her dead son. When she finally did appear, she wore the clothes of a mourner. She was so seldom seen that she became known as the shadow of the White House. Well, after four pretty much uneventful years, Franklin Pierce was not nominated for a second term. Here is the sad example of a couple that faced adversity and it made them angry and bitter towards God. Their lives spiraled downward into depression and despair. Jane remained a recluse until her death. And Franklin Pierce fought alcoholism and ultimately died of cirrhosis of the liver in his early 60s. But I want to tell you about another person who lived during the same time period as Franklin Pierce when he was president. 
This person suffered from adversity as well, but she refused to blame God. Fanny Crosby was born as a healthy child with full sight. But at six months old, she developed a bad cold and a a quack doctor applied a, a mustard poultice to her eyes. That mistreatment ruined her eyes. It blinded her for life. But this young woman refused to be angry. She refused to be bitter about her blindness. At just age eight, she wrote this poem. Age eight. Oh, what a happy soul am I. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. There's some great maturity in an eight-year-old little girl right there. Fanny Crosby was a faithful member of the local church in Brooklyn. She eventually in her lifetime would write over 9,000 hymns, including such beloved songs as Blessed Assurance and To God Be the Glory. On the day that Franklin Pierce was inaugurated as president, he was angry and bitter towards God. Fanny Crosby was 33 years old, and she wrote these very powerful words. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Friends, what is your attitude towards your pain and adversity? Like Franklin Pierce, has it caused you to become bitter? Or like Fanny Crosby, has it made you better? Have you come to a place in your life where you can say, for I know whatever befalls me, Jesus does all things well. Our lives are going to be full of sighs. But take heart, friends. Jesus understands sigh language. And at the end of your sighs, remember, Jesus does all things well. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the hope that we have only in Jesus. Lord, we look in our world and we see brokenness, we see wars, we see hatred, we see division. But Father, when we look to you, when we look to our Lord and Savior, we see joy and peace and comfort and hope. Father, thank you that you have a plan for each of us beyond this world. Father, thank you for inviting us into your eternal family. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice that makes that possible. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are with us, sustaining us through the sighs and the heartaches of life and giving us a certain hope because of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to share together in just a moment in the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is Jesus' way of reminding us that he's with us. We remember his death. We remember his brokenness. We remember his blood. That's what the communion is about, because through those things, through his death, he provides what we need most of all, and that is eternal life. And so that, let that be our focus today as we share together in the bread and in the cup. We invite you as the music plays in just a moment, you can make your way to one of the two tables at the front here. There's also two at the back. Remember those two cups are stacked together, the bread representing the body of our Lord and Jesus. It's on the bottom. The juice on the top represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins.
We invite you to take the communion at the table if you'd like. You can take it back to your seat and just reminisce and think for a few moments if you'd like to do that. If it's difficult for you to make your way to one of the tables, simply raise your hand. We've got some folks in the back that will be glad to come and serve you where you're seated. But above all, let us draw our hearts and our minds to the sacrifice that Jesus has made for me, for you, for each one that calls upon him as Lord and Savior. May God bless you today.
this next song is a newer song. It's called Great Are You, Lord. And I started thinking about it and wondered, you know, what are some of the synonyms for the word great when we talk about our great God? Well, one of the things that I saw said there are 260, no, 232 synonyms for the word great. And I didn't look at all of them, but here are a few. Exceptional. Awesome. Eminent. Noble. Celebrated. Noteworthy. Extraordinary. Famous. Illustrious. Just think of those songs, those words as you're singing to him about his greatness.
Amen. We serve a mighty God. Nothing is too difficult. Amen? Amen. Just before we have our closing prayer, just a couple of quick announcements to let you know about. Uh, I wanted to remind you that our uh, adult Bible fellowships kind of kicked off today, and so it's not too late for you to begin to attend one of those uh, two groups going right now. Those meet at 9 o'clock every Sunday morning, and uh, we've got some great teachers, great discussion leaders, and it would be a great blessing for you to be there to support them and to be blessed by uh, the information and fellowship that's available through our adult Bible fellowships. Also want to remind you that our restoration ministry ministry class begins uh, today at 3 p.m. It's not too late to sign up for that either. And uh, Fred and Sharon will be in the lobby. They have a table set up. You can ask questions and get involved. That uh, begins today at 3 p.m. Also this week, some of our life groups are kicking off. If you've not picked up one of these uh, inserts or uh, flyers, they're at the front table right by the front doors. And that lists all of these ABFs, life groups that are available to you. A couple of new ones coming up for women. And of course, our kids program uh, midweek. Awana starts on October, uh, first, sun, first Wednesday in October, October 6th. So you can start uh, getting your kids, grandkids ready for that. I think that's everything I've got. Let's pray together as we uh, dismiss. Father, we are so grateful to be invited into your eternal kingdom. Father, we pray that as we leave this building today, Lord, that the joy of the Lord would sustain us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, and Lord, that our our conviction to follow your truths in your ways, Lord, would guide us through our decisions each and every day. Father, we go with joy today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. We're dismissed. Amen.